Hello everybody and you're very welcome back to the Agrimotive Farm Machinery YouTube channel. So as you've seen already from the thumbnail and from the description, today's video, this week's video is all about IH International Harvester, probably the most famous uh, farm machinery tractor manufacturer to come out of the US uh, all through the 1900s um, from 1902 right up to 19, the mid 1980s. So in this video, we're going to talk about the history of the International Harvester Company, um, or IH as most people, most people call them. We're going to talk about the history, the formation of it, the different models coming up through the years, up until 1986, and what actually happened to the company, why International, the name as such, in regards to tractors, uh, sort of disappeared. Um, now, I will be doing a different video, a second video, sort of in this series on the worldwide uh, international range of tractors. So the tractors that would have been built in the UK and the tractors that were built in Germany. So the 1455 and the, the, the big tractors like that and then the smaller ones that were built in the UK. I will have a separate video on this, but this one is about the formation of the International Harvester Company right through to all the tractor models that they would have had uh, throughout the years in, in the US um, right up till, till 1986. And look, at, we all know that international, and then when you look at Case and David Brown and uh, the Tenneco company, McCormick, all those companies that sort of came together, they all amalgamated. Um, and it was quite difficult to research it and to find out who owned who, who owned what. There was a lot of buying and selling, a lot of swapping going on. It was, you know, there is, it, it's an awkward, it was an awkward sort of a structure uh, to try and get your head around it. Um, but I've, I've done my best. I put this video together. So most people has probably, have probably seen the David Brown video already. So we talked about David Brown right up into the 1980s and how they were taken over by Tenneco, who owned Case, um, who, you know, the David Brown tractors became Case tractors, um, Case IH. Then, you know, that's where International got swamped into the, got, got swallowed up by Tenneco as well and Case. And the IH name lived on then in the case IH brand. Um, so yeah, so that's it. Um, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, it, it's a good history lesson, a really, really good history lesson. Very interesting. Uh, some fantastic models, as everybody knows, superb models. Um, one, like, you know, they were di up there. They were probably ahead of John Deere at the time uh, throughout the US, um, up through the 1940s, 50s and 60s. Uh, they were way ahead of their time as regards their diesel engines and stuff like that. Um, so we'll get into that in a minute. But before that, I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone that watched the Zetter video last Sunday. Now, the, the views on it are still flying up. So as regards uh, my channel, you know, I've only got 2,000 subscribers and I've got well over, I'm nearly at 8,000 views on that now. But the comments on that video were just fantastic. Of all the videos that I've done, um, and the David Brown video like that, um, with over 60,000 views, um, there's all well over 100 comments on the Zetter video and the stories and the history that people have. Um, they really seem to appreciate and have a great fondness and love for that brand. So I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who has uh, replied, commented, left their little stories about their time with Zetter through the 70s and 80s and people that still have them now that are still still um uh driving them so yeah thanks to everybody um i really really appreciate that the, it's the comments that drive this channel um that help get youtube to spread it out so every little whether it's just a thumbs up or anything it all helps but the effort that some people go into is fantastic so we will get into International Harvester. So the International Harvester Company, often abbreviated as we know as IH or International, was an American manufacturer of agricultural and construction equipment, automobiles, commercial trucks, lawn and garden products, household equipment and more. So it was formed in 1902 with a merger of the McCormick Harvesting Machine Company and the Deering Harvesting Machine Company. Um, so there was also, I think, three other small manufacturers that were swamped up into it. So I think Plano and Warden, uh, Bushnell, and, uh, Bushnell and Glessner, yeah, and Milwaukee as well. So its brands included McCormick, Deering, and later McCormick Deering, as well as the International uh, that we're all familiar with. 
along with Farmall and Cub Cadet Tractors International is also known for the Scout and the Travel All Vehicle nameplates. In the 1980s, all divisions were sold off except the International Trucks, which changed its parent company name to Navistar International. Following years of financial and economic decline, the International began selling its separate equipment divisions, starting with the sale of the construction division to a company called Dresser Industries in 1982. In November 1984, IH finalised a deal with Tenneco to sell the farm equipment division to Tenneco's subsidiary, Case Corporation, and the brand continues as Case IH, which we all know now is owned by Case New Holland. So the European division exists today as McCormick Tractors and is owned by the Italian company Argo. So Argo um, would have bought into McCormick some time ago, I don't know, was it 15 or 20 years ago, Argo Company took over McCormick and they also have Landini as well. Um, and they have a, an Irish distributor, Argo have an Irish distributor. They, themselves, Argo themselves have a distributorship down in Shannon in County Clare. So International became solely a truck and engine manufacturer and reorganized as Navistar International in 1986. Throughout its existence, International Harvester was headquartered in Chicago, Illinois. In 2020, Volkswagen agreed to fully purchase the remaining shares of the Navistar company. So the roots of International Harvester run back to the 1830s, actually, when Virginia inventor Cyrus Hall McCormick perfected his version of the horse-drawn reaper, which he field demonstrated in 1831 and for which he received a patent in 1834. Together with his brother, Leander uh, J. McCormick, he moved to Chicago in 1847 to be closer to the Midwestern grain fields and founded the McCormick Harvesting Machine Company. The reaper sold very well, uh, partially as a result of savvy and innovative business practices. Their products came onto the market just as the development of the railroads offered wide distribution to distant territories. He developed a fast network uh, to demonstrate his field operations. And this was very similar to what John Deere had done around the same time with their plows and stuff like that. McCormick died in 1884 and his company passed to his son, Cyrus McCormick Jr., whose incompetence towards organised labour sparked the Haymarket Affair, the origin of the May Day as a labour holiday. The International Harvester Agricultural Division may have been second to the truck division, but it was the best known subsidiary. One of its early products was the traction engine, a frame manufactured by Morton uh, Traction Truck Company featured an IHC engine. So IHC is uh, International Corporation, yeah. From 1902 to the early 1920s, the McCormick and Deering dealerships kept their original branding with mobile tractors sold by McCormick and Titan tractors at Deering due to its still present competitiveness of its former rivals. IH produced a range of tractor gasoline powered farm tractors under the Mogul and Titan brands. Sold by McCormick dealers, the Type C Mogul was little more than a stationary engine on a tractor chassis fitted with a friction drive, so one, one forward speed and one reverse speed. Between 1911 and 1914, 862 of these little tractors were built. These tractors had varied success, but the trend going into the mid-1910s was towards the small and the cheap. So the company's first important tractors were the 1020 and the 1530 models. Introduced in 1915, they were primarily used as traction engines to pull plows and for belt work on threshing machines. The 1020 and the 1530 had similar mogul and titan versions. Concurrently, IHC purchased a number of smaller competitors. So P&O Plow and the Chattanooga Plow were purchased in 1919. Other brand names they incorporated. Kemp, Meadows, Sterling, Weber, Plano and the Champion Company. In 1924 then IH introduced the Farmall, so this is the Farmall name that we're very very familiar with today, a smaller uh, general purpose tractor to fend off competition from the Ford Motor Company's Fords and Tractors. Um, the Farmall was a leader in the emerging row crop tractor segment. Following the introduction of Farmall, several uh, similarly styled F-series models were introduced while the original design continued to be produced as the regular. In 1932, IH produced the first diesel engine for the McCormick Deering TD40 crawler. This engine would start in gas and then switch over to diesel. Other diesel engines of this era were difficult to start in cold conditions and using gasoline allowed the engine to thoroughly warm up first. In 1935, this was used in the WD40 becoming the first diesel tractor on wheels in North America. But as we know, 
the first diesel tractor in the world was uh, Germany's Defense Sendling BS6, which was built in 1922. But then at the heavy tractor range up into the 1930s, um, so the market for industrial tractors grew in the 1930s, the TD40, uh, the first of IH's uh, heavy equipped crawlers was suitable for, for a wide range of environments. As demand for construction equipment grew, so did the competition. The, the diversification of agricultural tractor range into genuine construction equipment whetted the appetites for further expansion. In 1937, IH engage, engaged designer Raymond Lowy to revamp his product line and logo. In 1938, the first such tractor was the TD65 heavy tractor, later named the TD18. So for model year 1939, Raymond Louis created the styling for the Farmall letter series of tractors. So you had the A and the B and the BN, the C, the H and the M, and the McCormick Deering standard series, uh, W4, W6 and the W9. <clears throat> for 1941, uh, the MD model was introduced as the first row crop diesel power tractor. Over a decade later, IH's first competitor, John Deere, introduced a diesel option on their row crop models. So as you can see, IH are well ahead of the game there. The letter series tractors were updated to the Super Series in 1953, with the exception of the A, which had become a Super in 1947, and the B and the BN, which were discontinued in 1948. Many of these tractors, especially the larger, um, the largest, the M, the H and the W models, are still in operation on many farms today. Especially desirable are the diesel-powered MD, the WD6 and the WD9 models. The letter and standard series of tractors was produced until 1954 and it was the defining product in the IH history. In 1947, the smallest tractor in the Farmall line was the Little Cub. So it was introduced with a 60 cubic inch four-cylinder engine and a 69 inch wheelbase. The Cub was aimed at small farms which had previously relied on horse-drawn equipment. So like the various John Deere, the L and the LA and the LI models that we spoke about before, one of the mechanisation resistant markets it hoped to penetrate was the small one mule family farm in the rural American deep south. But the Cub also sold to a lot of owners of larger farms that maybe wanted a second tractor. Production of the Cub commenced at the newly acquired and updated farm oil works in Louisville uh, plant, formerly the, what would have been the wartime uh, Curtis Wright Aircraft Factory in Kentucky. So the, the Cub at the time sold for the, the princely sum of $545, so that was in 1947. So the Cub proved extremely popular and its design continued largely unchanged mechanically until 1979. So for 1955 in IH the numbered 100 series was offered, although given slightly different styling and few new features, there were still updates from the models introduced in 1939. The only new tractor was uh, in, in 1959 lineup was the 300 utility. In 1957, power was increased in some models and the 230 utility was introduced. So in regards to the heavy tractors of the 1950s, IH would sell 38,000 of the TD18 series tractors between 1938 and 1958. The TD18 would be replaced by an upgraded TD-18A, the 1949, sorry, in 1949, the 181 and the 182 variants in 1955. In 1958, the TD-20 crawler was introduced. In July 1958, IH introduced a major campaign to introduce a new line of tractors, which was to become the 60 series. At the Hillsdale, Illinois testing farm, IH entertained over 12,000 dealers from 25 different countries. This, as you can imagine, was a huge, huge launch for, for international 12,000 dealers. Incredible, yeah. So the series introduced the first of its kind six cylinder, 460 and 560 range tractors. Unfortunately, just a year later, these models were all recalled due to final drive component failures. They had not been updated since 1939 and would fail uh, rapidly under the stress of the more powerful 60 series engines. Some customers lost faith in IH and migrated to John Deere's new generation of power uh, tractors that were introduced in the 1960s. Um, a similar, similar story to what happened with, um, with Leyland uh, and Marshall when they went to the bigger six cylinder uh, higher horsepower engines, but still used the same, you know, they still used the same transmission and back end uh, issues arose. They haven't put the, the research and the, the design and development into 
that stronger, beefier back end to be able to take the extra horsepower and it paid dearly for it. <clears throat> so in the 1960s, so throughout the 1960s, IH introduced new tractors and new sales techniques. As producing tractors was the lifeblood of the company, IH would have to remain competitive in this field. They both succeeded and failed at this goal, but farming was the change. So in 1963, IH introduced the 73 horsepower 706 and the 95 horsepower 806 tractors. Until the 88 series, all numbered series tractors followed a very simple uh, numbering system. So the first two or three digits was the horsepower rating, and the last number was the number of cylinders. So the 1486 would have been 148 horsepower six cylinder, and uh, the 1468 would have been 146 horsepower. Um, eight cylinder, so the V8 engine. In 1964, IH made it made its four million tractor, uh, which was I think an 806, yeah, an 806. In 1965, IH introduced its first 100 horsepower two wheel drive tractor, the 120, 1206. Sorry, the 1206. Another option became available in 1965 for the 706, the 806, and the new 1206. In factory installed cabs made by Sloper Allen Company, and these were often referred to as the ice cream box uh, due to its shape. It could be equipped with a fan and a heater, and by 1967, over 100,000 models of the 706, the 806, and 1206 were built. The 276 was also built at this time, becoming popular for smaller farms with tighter lanes and fields due to its lighter weight. In 1967, saw the introduction of the bigger and more powerful 56 series tractors as replacements for the popular uh, 06 models. These new models included the 65 horsepower 656, uh, the 756, the uh, 856 and the 1256. So the ice cream box cab was still an option. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1969, IH introduced the 1456 turbo at 131 horsepower. Also that year, the 91 horsepower 826 was introduced with the option of gear shift or hydrostatic transmissions. The ice cream box cab was dropped and replaced with a new custom cab built by XL Industries which could be equipped with factory air conditioning, heat and an AM radio, can you imagine? So another milestone um, was the 1970 uh, introduction of the 1026 Hydro, basically a hydrostatic version of the 1256 and at that time it was the most powerful hydrostatic transmission tractor made in the US with 114 horsepower. 1970s then, so in 1971, IH introduced the 66 series line. The new models included the 766, the 966, the 1066 Turbo, uh, the 1466 Turbo, and the 1468, so that was the V8, that was 145 horsepower uh, V8. The 130 horsepower 4166 four wheel drive was also introduced. The 966 and the 1066 were available with hydro or gear shift transmission and the choice of a two post rollover protection system or two different cabs, the custom or the deluxe. Both could be equipped with air conditioning, heat and uh, an AM FM radio. 1972 then saw the introduction of the 666, uh, which replaced the long run in 656. The 150 horsepower uh, 1568 BA replaced the 1468 and the 160 horsepower 1566 replaced the 163 horsepower 4366 uh, sorry and the 14 the 163 horsepower 4366 four wheel drive was also introduced also later that year uh, four post uh, ropes or rollover protection cabs uh, custom cabs was dropped and the lux cab was now painted red instead of white on February the 1st, 1974, at 9 o'clock, the 5 million tractor came off the assembly line at the Farm Wall plant in Illinois. IEH was the first tractor manufacturer to accomplish this. Also in 1973, IEH officially dropped the Farm Wall name from its tractor. Uh, this ended in the era that began with the first Farm Wall regular back in 1924. But as we know today, the Farm Wall name is a very, very popular name with all you case men out there. Um, small size tractor in the probably I don't know 70 to 100 horsepower bracket that post uh, you know that before you went up into the big six cylinder tractors the, the farm one it was very very popular today so moving on then getting towards the end of the line so you got the the 230 horsepower 4568 V8 four-wheel drive was introduced in 1975 
1976, the entire tractor got a new paint job and decal pattern. No longer were the side panels all white with chrome and black decals. They were now all red with a black striped sticker. This was done done to clear inventory for the upcoming, you know, the Pro Ag line, that was the famous line. Um, in September 1976, IH released their 86 series Pro Ag line. These models included the 786, the 886, the 986, uh, the 186 Hydro, and the 1086, the 1486, and last in the line was 161 horsepower. One five, sorry, the fifteen eighty six. Yeah, <coughs> hard to get to keep all those numbers in my head. So these new tractors had a new cab dubbed the control center that became standard with air conditioning, heat, several radio or CB options. The driver sat well ahead of the rear axle, and the fuel tank was mounted behind the cab over the rear axle. This increased balance and improved ride. Also in nineteen seventy six, the sixty two horsepower six eight six, along with the eighty six series. Four-wheel drives were introduced, including the 4186, the 4386, the 4586, and the 4786. In 1977, International Harvester, of course, introduced the famous uh, axle flow rotary combine. This machine was produced at East Moline, Illinois, um, at the first generation of axle flow combines. So in 1979, IH introduced two all-new tractors. So the 33 3388 and the 3588. So these are nicknamed the Droopies, a uh, very, very popular collector's item uh, in America at the minute. It's hard got, but commanding huge, huge money. So uh, so these were known as a two plus two four wheel drive line. So these tractors were the result of taking two 1086 rear ends and hooking them together with a transfer case. A year later, the 3788 was introduced. Although these tractors performed well in the field, they never really sold all that well. <clears throat> so moving into the 1980s then. So as the 1980s began, IHS faced a stable economy, yet an unknown fate. In September 1981, IH introduced at a dealership meeting the new 50 series of tractors, which included the 136, uh, sorry, the 136 horsepower 5088, the 162 horsepower 5288, and the 187 horsepower 5488. IH also released the 30 series, which included the 81 horsepower 3088, the 90 horsepower 3288, and the 112 horsepower 3488 hydro, and the 113 horsepower 3688. These new tractors proved once again that IH was innovative. So, designed and styled by IH industrial designer Greg Montgomery from Montgomery Design International, the new style uh, of design of the 50 and 30 series changed the look of tractors from that time forward. IH spent almost $30 million, uh, $30 million to develop this new series and the result was the last great line of tractors from International Harvester. <clears throat> Many technology related innovations were used in the new series. A computer monitoring system uh, dubbed Zentry, or sorry, Sentry was developed. The IH system, the first IH became the first manufacturer to add a computer to a farm tractor. Other innovations included the Z shift pattern, an 18 speed synchronized transmission, a forward airflow cooling system which sucked air from above the hood and blew it out through the front grille. Power priority three pump hydraulic system, uh, cover coated hydraulic lines and controls, and a new rear hitch system. The 50 series had an unprecedented three year or two and a half thousand hour engine and drivetrain warranty, which later became the industry standard. So while no new sales records were set, IH sold a respectable number of these tractors during their short production time. IH also released the 60 series 2 plus 2s and planned on making the Super 70 series 2 plus 2s, but only a handful of these exist today. On May the 14th, 1985, the last IH tractor rolled off the factory line in the States and it was a 5488. So that was it. That was, that was the wind up of the international tractor line uh, from the States. And just on a side note, <coughs> So in the, in the late 1970s, IH entered a deal with Spain's INASA to build diesel engines uh, there as international de motors. So obviously that's Spanish. After a downturn in the market, coupled to problems with Spain's entry into the EEC at the time, this threatened the profitability of this project. 
International Harvester withdrew from this project in 1982 in return for being allowed to escape from all conditions of the joint venture. IH lost their upfront investment in the engine plant and ended up selling their British truck manufacturer, Selen Sidden Atkinson, which had belonged to International Harvester since 1974 to Inasa in 1983. And that's something I didn't know. I didn't know that International had owned a Seddon Atkinson, which would have been a hugely popular uh, truck brand uh, across the UK and Ireland at the time. So that's it for the tractors. That's it pretty much uh, for International. <clears throat> so when you look at International and look at the brand names that are associated with it, so you had, over the years you had different brand names. So you had the International brand itself from 1902 to 1985. You had Titan from 1910 to 1924. You had Mogul obviously from 1911 to 1922. McCormick Deering from 1922 to 1947. McCormick themselves then from 1947 to 1958. The Farmall brand then from 1924 to 1973. There was Fairway then from 1924 to 1938. Electrol from 1954 to 1955. So yeah, a huge lineup, uh, a huge history. Um, and I suppose when you look at International as well, they were, they were famous as well for, you know, I know they're predominantly a tractor company, IH also sold several different, several different types of farm related equipment such as balers, cultivators, combines, uh, combine headers, corn shellers, cotton pickers, manure spreaders, hay rakes, crop dusters, disc harrows, elevators, blah 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 and so on and so forth. Um, so that's it, um, my dog has come to say hello to me here, he, he think he, he's had enough of me uh, yapping on, haven't you? Uh, uh, so um, that's it, that's it for International. Um, so the next video in this lineup following on from this series will be on the, the Worldwide series that was built in the UK um, uh, that we will be more familiar with in Ireland and England and across Europe. Um, I will be following on from that. Um, and obviously that will tie in as well nicely with uh, David Brown, David Brown video. And then of course we will have case video in this lineup as well and it'll all come together someplace around the 1980s into the 1990s where we have what we have today as case ih um where they all kind of blended together oh even mccormick as well of course um so that's it so thank you very much uh if you've gotten this far in the video if your head is not melted with figures and numbers and horsepowers and whatnot uh thanks very much for watching uh i'm going to sit down now for a couple of hours and try and edit this out so it will be up to use on Sunday morning, hopefully. Yeah, so thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you all next week.